Well, good morning, everybody. Glad you're here. You can uh, find your seats, and we'll uh, jump into our study. We love to have the fellowship time. Um, you know, the Lord dwells in the presence of His, of His people, and specifically dwells in the presence of His people praising. That's why we sing. That's why we like the welcome time to just say welcome. We're glad you're here. Um, and then also, of course, God dwells in His Word, and so we read His Word together. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to 1 Kings. That's where we'll be, chapters 20 and 21 uh, this morning. We've been working through our series uh, in the book of 1 Kings, 2 Kings, and 2 Chronicles. Uh, the series is called In the Lord's Sight because in all three of those books, dozens and dozens of times, over 75 times, the phrase in the Lord's eyes or in the Lord's sight is used because it's talking about men, in particular kings, who either did what was evil in the Lord's sight or did what was right in the Lord's sight. Or maybe they did some things that were right in the Lord's sight, but then the Lord says, but didn't do these things that they were supposed to do in my sight. And so the Lord is watching. He's looking. He's looking at us. He's looking at our world. We think he's off somewhere like silent and distant. And we looked at the fact that Elijah kind of mocked the gods, the prophet Elijah, who was one of the prophets during this time period. We'll read about him a little bit this morning. But last week, we looked at him taking on the gods of Baal, which weren't really gods anyway, and mocking those gods and saying, maybe your God's silent. Maybe he's asleep. Maybe he's not paying attention. And then, of course, the miracle of fire coming down from heaven and consuming the sacrifice that Elijah had offered. And so the question that you have to deal with and that we have to ask over and over again, is this idea of what does it mean to do what is right in the Lord's sight? Because I don't know if you know this, but there are multiple religions in the world who all think they're doing what's right in their Lord's or their God's sight. There are people who say all paths lead to the same place. I've read many of the ancient texts of the multiple religions. I was a history major in college. I was an Asian studies minor, so I had to study East Asia and all of its religions. I was almost a religious studies minor just by one class. I need to take one more class to be a religious studies minor. And I am telling you, the religions do not say the same stuff. They are vastly, vastly different. They are not the same. And Christianity is the one that's like none of the others. So like if you're going to get rid of one religion and decide the God I don't want to look at or think or have in my sights Christianity is the first one to dismiss because it's not like all the others. It's different than all the rest. So it's the first one you should say, out, done. Because it's the one that says, even if you're moral, even if you do as good as you can, it's not good enough and you're going to spend eternity separated from God. All the other religions say, if you just keep getting better, then in the end, God will grade on the curve and maybe you're better than average. Christianity doesn't say that. It's the only one that says you cannot save yourself. It's impossible. All the other ones say you can save yourself if you just do what we leaders tell you to do that God told us to do and told us to tell you to do in our sight. It's a power grab. Christianity is the one that sent their, his God and Jesus actually became God in the flesh in our sight. So he said, this is what it looks like to be God in the world and we crucified him. It's different than the rest. And if you will take the time to actually read all the Quran, the Upanishads, if, if you read them, they're different. They're not the same. They do not present the same picture of who the Lord is and what he's looking for. And there's nothing that shows that more than when we dive into 1 Kings. Again, just to catch you up on a little bit of history, we are now a few generations in to Kings. Remember, God's people weren't supposed to have a king. God wanted to be their king. They said, no, we want, we want to be like everybody else. We want a king. God said, fine, have a king. It's not going to go well for you. It's going to go badly. And I'm just going to have to come and be your king anyway. So go ahead and do your king thing for a while, and you're going to be miserable. And that's exactly what happens. That's what 1 Kings, 2 Kings, and 2 Chronicles lays out. The misery of God's people being led by wicked men, wicked kings, wicked fathers who pass down wickedness to their kids. 
Kids that decided they didn't want to do what was righteous like their kings, their fathers who were the kings before, but they wanted to take power instead of submit themselves and surrender themselves to the people like maybe a righteous father like Asa or Jehoshaphat. No, 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 I don't want to be like that. I want to be evil. I want to take more for myself. And you just see this constant battle that they were never supposed to be in because they weren't supposed to have a king. God was supposed to be their king. And we're the same way. We want to be our own kings instead of allow God to be king. We, we look at them and think, how could they do that? Because we do it. It's no different. It's just they actually had political power and we don't. We're just kind of peons in the world. <laughs> and so you, we dive into this passage and now the kingdom has been split. There was King David, then King Solomon. King Solomon wrote three books of the Bible, but he didn't follow his own advice. It was miserable. The kingdom falls under his wicked son, Rehoboam. The kingdom is divided between a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. Jeroboam, one of the advisors of Solomon, and one of the advisors uh, that, that built most of what Solomon wanted built, takes the northern kingdom and ten tribes, which you see. And then the southern kingdom was taken by Judah, which was one tribe. And you see on the map the picture of where we're at. A divided people, a divided kingdom. Man, I'm so glad we're not like this anymore. North and south, divided, trying to pick the right king to lead us, and we just get the right king, it'll fix everything. There is nothing new under the sun. <laughs> this keeps going on, and that's why this book is so critical. These three books are so critical, because it paints the picture of right what we're in the middle of. It is like obvious and God sends prophets to, to warn and to try to get them to trust him. He tries to tell the kings, no, you, you have a king now, so you're going to have to deal with it. You know, Father's Day can be a hard time for people. Father's Day can be a hard time for fathers because if you actually reflect on your life as a father, it probably doesn't look good. I know when most of the time when I think of my life as a father, I don't think of all the great things I did. I think of all the ways I'm just a miserable wreck and failure. Most of the time I sit back and think, oh gosh, I wish I would have known that. I wish I would have done that. I mean, I spend so much time telling my kids I'm so sorry. I do, now that they're older. I've told all my kids, you'll probably need a counselor. But I'm serious, I'm not paying for it. But you'll need one, right? God's a great counselor. You'll need the word, you'll need the church, you'll need disciples, you'll need mentors, you'll need pastors, and you may need professional help because of me. I'm just saying and if you don't think that, then you don't know the gospel because the gospel says that we are so desperate for someone to teach us, to save us, to lead us because our world is such a disaster. And in the midst of this, you have to remember there are a bunch of people that are having to live in, in this. They're after following a wicked king and figuring out how to live their lives and do what God says to do when it's hard to do what God says to do when they're punished for doing what God said to do, because we just read earlier that Jezebel, which we'll read about today, killed a bunch of God's prophets, just slaughtered them. These men that were righteous, trying to lead the northern kingdom back to God when they had created their own idols. They made two golden calves and made two different places of worship, Dan all the way in the north and Bethel in the south. And then they closed the road off to go from Bethel to Jerusalem so no one in the northern kingdom was allowed to travel to actually worship God according to the Bible. They were stopped. And if you went to Jerusalem and you were found out, you were punished for worshiping God properly. As he said to worship him in Jerusalem, in the Old, temple, or in the Old Testament, at the place of worship. See, we're caught in the same mess. Now, this morning, what I want us to look at as we dive in is this. It's right in the text. Ways of his father. Ways of his father. You see, we're in the mess we're in because the original father of all humanity, by the way, even science says we all originated from one common ancestor. So there was one common ancestor at some point that started all this mess. Glad they figured that out. My Bible said that a long time ago. There was one ancestor, Adam, and God said that the curse came through Adam. Adam sinned the man, and the authority of man, the authority of the father figure, brought the curse into the world. And isn't it amazing that the blessing 
And the salvation of God comes through the Father, and you ready for this? A son who is obedient. A different kind of dad who asked his son not to have all he wanted, but to give his life, and that son to willingly say, I will be about the ways of my father, and my father is just, and he is holy, and someone has to pay the price for my siblings. I'll take it. It is the most beautiful picture that you could be offered. Because I don't know about you, but it'd be really hard for me to die for most of my brothers. Just saying. I'd be like, mm, you did that. I'll see you tomorrow. Let's see how it goes for you. Right? Because I'm an idiot. They're an idiot. I'm like, you, you pay for your idiot. I'll pay for my idiot. Have a nice day. But our God and Jesus, who's called the second part of the Trinity, the Son of God, showed us the way of the Father. So let's dive in. We pick up the story in the southern kingdom in 2 Chronicles 17. We read this last week, but we're focusing in the northern kingdom because God just has a lot more to say about Ahab and Jezebel and how wicked they were because he wants us to see it clearly, what it looks like to be in the Lord's sight and what it looks like to not be in the Lord's sight. And most of the Bible is a lot of like, here's what it looks like not to be in the Lord's sight. You want to know why? Because to do what's right in the Lord's sight is really simple. <laughs> you don't need that much information. We make it really complicated. God does it. He makes it really simple. And then most of the Bible is just written to say, here's all the way you've complicated simple. And here's the simple. It says, now the Lord was with Jehoshaphat because he walked in the former ways of his father David. He did not seek the Baals. Those are the gods, Baal and Asherah of the northern kingdom that they decided to leave Yahweh and create Baal and Asherah. Baal and Asherah were male and female. They got together. They had kids and offspring and the whole thing. And it says, but sought the God of his father and walked in his commands, not according to the practices of the northern kingdom of Israel. So here's Jehoshaphat. He comes to the throne. His father Asa was righteous. Jehoshaphat is even more righteous. Jehoshaphat's like, I want to do what my father Asa did. Remember, Asa's dad was horrible, wicked, killed quickly, didn't reign very long. Asa's dad died. Asa decides he's going to act. Remember Asa? I love it. It's one of my favorite stories in the Bible. Asa chopped down his grandmother's Asherah pole and burned it in front of her and in front of everyone. He's like, Grandma, we don't do that. Chop it down, done. Do that at your grandma's house and see how it goes. Like, that's how righteous Asa, Asa was. And Jehoshaphat would have seen that and been like, wow, my dad was willing to take on grandma. That's pretty, that's bold, right? And so Jehoshaphat is this righteous man, and he's going all the way back, not to, Dave, to Asa. He's going back and saying, okay, there was a king Saul who was wicked, and then God raised up a king David who was righteous, and he's saying, what did David do? Even though David was a murderer and adulterer and did stupid things, how did he repent of those things? How did he teach the people? What was David like? What was the way that he saw God and God was in his sights? How did, God, how did David think about the heavenly father? Because David in the psalm writes about our father in heaven all the time in the psalms. So Je Jehoshaphat's not just looking at Asa, he's going all the way back to David and saying, what does it look like to have a godly king? Because I want to be a king like that. We need more fathers and more men who have that passion to not look at what, it, what was my dad like or what was this church like, but to go all the way back and say, what does it look like to be righteous in God's sight because of Jesus? And what does it look like to say, I want your way, God, regardless of the cost? We need that desperately. I need that in my own life. And I need people that are going to encourage me to do that. It goes on and it said, look at this. When Jehoshaphat said, I'm going to obey God's commands, this is what he did. His mind rejoiced in the Lord's ways, and he again removed the high places and the Asherah poles from Judah. Whenever the bad stuff would migrate north, the teachings in the northern kingdom would migrate north, Jehoshaphat's like, get that out of here. We are not bringing that in here. We are not having that. That is not what God's word says. We are not bringing Asherah and Baal stuff here. Not doing it. Take it back. And he goes on and he says... And look, his mind rejoiced. It wasn't just his actions. His mind was constantly just happy about the fact that he was righteous in God's sight and, he, and that he knew the ways of his father. And he was, his mind was just consumed with how great God was. You want to know why I know his mind was consumed with that? Look at the proof. It says, 
He got rid of all the asterisks. He, he went after the things that were unrighteous. And then, in the third year of his reign, Jehoshaphat sent his officials and the Levites. They taught throughout Judah, having the book of the Lord's instruction with them. That's as much of the word of God as they had at that time. Other than the Psalms, which they sang all the time. This was the book of the law, and he sent them out. They went through the towns of Judah and taught the people. The terror of the Lord was on all the kingdoms of the land that surrounded Judah, so they did not fight against Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat's like, I just want my people to know God's word. I don't want them to listen to me. I don't have to be the one that that sends an edict out. I'm going to send who God said I should send out, which are the priests, the Levites, and his leaders. I'm going to say, trust your leaders, not I'm the king, you do what I say. See, Jehoshaphat knows how it's supposed to work, and he does it, and he's righteous. And he's like, we got to know the book. If we don't know the book, then we're done. We're toast. I'm toast. I can't lead you. we got nothing to go by. And today, we keep trying to figure out ways to change the book, to fit our culture, constantly. We were talking about this at staff meeting on Friday, and Jason brought up a great point. i got to give him credit. And we were talking about being shocked at the fact that why do we get to this place where we just can't accept God's word? we got to change it. we got to make it culturally well, relevant. And then he said, well, you realize that all of our holidays aren't the biblical holidays. We had to rename them and change them to be culturally relevant. Christmas is the feast of dedication, according to the Old Testament. Pentecost? No, it's not Pentecost. Sukkoth. Or no, Shavat. Shavat, sorry. Shavat. Old Testament, you're to travel Jerusalem and worship. It's all right there in the Old Testament. Feast of Tabernacles? Do you... You know the Feast of Tabernacles? That's, that's Sukkot in the New Testament, or in the, in the Old Testament. Do you, do you even know what those holidays mean? Do you even know how to celebrate them? Do you even know what they're about? They're all about Jesus, and if you don't know them, you're going to be really surprised when you get to heaven someday, and you know what's going to happen? They're going to be celebrating Sukkot, Shabbat, Feast of and you're going to be like, what is this? I had no idea this existed. It's in the book. Did you read the book? No, I just kind of went with culture, whatever they did. We just, we have Mother's Day and birthdays, Father's Day. It was wonderful. Listen, we're to honor our mother and father. The Bible is clear on that. But do you want to know where Mother's Day came from? Have you looked up the history of it? I did because I was curious. Mother's Day and Father's Day, right? Which one do you think came first? What? Mother's Day. Mother's Day. It came about in 1910, and it was an advertising campaign, mostly. And it came with women's temperance and the idea of, like, voting and all that stuff. That's where it came from. That's Mother's Day. Do you know where Father's Day came from? Father's Day came from a bunch of miners, over 200 miners, that died in West Virginia in a mine, and a pastor preached the fact that we should probably have a day that honors men that are willing to go into coal mines to support their families and die. Because he was sick of Mother's Day. <laughs> so he gave a, he said, we need a Father's Day. Do you want to know when Mother's Day became an official holiday in the United States? It became an official holiday in 1914. Do you want to know when Father's Day became an official holiday in the United States? 1972. See, we don't like to talk about fathers, and I get it. Men have done some really wicked things in the past. But you can't get around the fact that the curse came through man and the blessing came through man. And men, we can't get around that fact. Don't try to put it off on the women. We own it. We own it. And so we have these things, and we don't even know. Jehoshaphat's like, i got to be sure everybody knows what they're in for. Everybody understands who they're following. Everybody knows what's right in God's eyes. Everybody knows the way our Heavenly Father wants us to be fathers and wants us to be husbands and wives and children. i I got to be sure everybody's got the word. So we pick up the story. Deuteronomy, sorry, Deuteronomy 6.1, this is called the Shema. It's the most famous passage quoted by the Israelite people all the way through their history, even to today. 
the most quoted passage and known passage of any Jew is this. It says, this is the command, the statutes, and the ordinances the Lord your God has instructed me to teach. Moses is telling them. So that you may follow them in the land you're about to enter and possess. Do this. Now remember, the land we're getting ready to enter and possess is not here. It's heaven. Okay? Jesus is going to bring a new earth and a new... We are not like getting earth better and ready so when Jesus comes back, he's like, good job. Way to go. You made the earth perfect for me. That is not going to happen. That's not how the story ends. The story ends with we keep storing stuff in the eternal heaven. It keeps getting worse here. And Jesus finally says, I'm done and I'm coming back. And the Father sends it. That's how it's going to end. We, you better get that straight because right here it says... You are getting ready to possess a land. Do this so you may fear the Lord your God all the days of your life by keeping all his statutes and commands I'm giving you, your son and your grandson, and so that you may have a long life. Duh. If the men in a culture don't know how to be right in God's sight, if they don't know the ways of the Father, they have testosterone and they kill one another. It's the history of the world aren't too many places where women started wars. It's men. We're designed to fight. We're supposed to be fighters. But we got to fight the right way, the God's way, the Father's way, not our way, not the world's way. That's why we crucified Jesus. We didn't like how he fought. Seems like he doesn't want to win. He's just hanging there on a cross. Yeah, I'm going to find a new guy to follow goes on and he says, look, listen, Israel, and be careful to follow them so you may prosper and multiply greatly because Yahweh, the God of your fathers, has promised you a land flowing with milk and honey. If you know Jesus Christ, you have been promised that land. There is a new earth and a new heaven coming for us. This promise still applies to us. Now, do we obey all the Old Testament laws? Not all of them because some of them are completed, which means you don't have to do them anymore. It would, okay, give you an example. It would be like if you're married and your wife dies, okay? Only you don't bury her, you just keep her in her house and keep serving her as a dead person. She's dead. Bury her. Mourn, go visit the gravesite, put some flowers on her birthday. I don't know, put a little something there. I don't know. You can do that. You can take your new wife with you. Once she's dead, you can get a new wife. Like, that's fine, okay? But you don't dig up your old wife and spend time with her. That's the Old Testament. Now, it doesn't mean your old wife was terrible. That's why I buried her. She was awful. That's the way that people treat the Old Testament. I'm just glad we don't have that Old Testament anymore. We just got New Testament. The old wife just gives you a picture of how to be a better wife and how to be a better husband. Like, what were the good parts of that marriage? What were the bad parts? I can improve. Like, that's the point of the Old Testament. And there are some things that we don't have to bring back. We don't have to sacrifice lambs. Why? Jesus is the lamb. We don't have to do those things because God's way with that relationship and that covenant is finished. He has a new way of doing things. Now, does that negate the old way? Nope. It fulfills it. It brings it full circle and points it all back to Jesus. And he goes on and he says, look, because Yahweh, the God of your fathers, has promised you a land flowing with milk and honey. Listen, Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Why does Moses have to tell the people that a monotheistic Yahweh God is one? Because he's in three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And God has already revealed that when he said, let us make man in our image when they hadn't made anything yet. Who's our? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. They've been there since the foundation of the world. He goes on and look, it says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And Jehoshaphat did that, but Ahab didn't. Look at what Jesus says about his heavenly Father. In the Bible, Jesus Jesus talks about his heavenly Father over 200 times. The word father is used over 1,300 times in the scripture. 1,300. Mother is only used 307 times. 
A thousand more times the word father is used in Scripture. And Jesus refers not to his heavenly mother, he refers to his heavenly father. Are mothers important? Absolutely. I have a great mom. Phenomenal mom. But you want to know something? Science has told us for decades, that years, that the most messed up people in the world are people that have absent fathers. Mom can be home. Mom can be there for you. But if you don't have that male father figure in your life, it messes everything up, girl or boy. Now, here's a crazy thing. It's actually better, statistically, you can look this up and psychologically, if you have an absent father you don't know and is never there than if you have a father who is present in the home but completely absent emotionally from you in your life. That actually double messes you up. And our God is neither. He is present and he is active right now if you want him to be. He goes on. Jesus says, when you pray, don't babble like the idolaters since they think they'll be heard for their many words. Don't be like them because your father knows the things you need before you ask him. Therefore, you should pray like this. Our father in heaven, your name be honored as holy. Not, hey, dad, I need stuff here on earth. No, no, no. You're in heaven. I'm stuck here. You have put me here. I really want to be with you, but I'm here. So you're holy and I'm not holy yet. But if I'm going to get to you, it means i got to be dead because I can't take this body because it's not holy. So, hi, <laughs> let's FaceTime. Like, we can't. He goes on and says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. What's God's will? To surrender to Jesus. And once you surrender to Jesus, then you receive the Holy Spirit, which then shows you God's will, and then you obey the Father. He goes on in Matthew, he says, all things have been entrusted to me by my Father. Jesus isn't like, I'm the king, you listen to me. He goes, no, no, no. There's this thing called the Trinity going on, and we all are unified. It's one God and three persons, and so you just need to know that. And then he says, no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son desires to reveal and Jesus on the cross revealed the Father and the resurrection revealed the Father to the world. This is what your dad looks like. This is what being a child of his will look like in your life. Jesus goes on to say this, whoever does the will of my Father in heaven, that person is my brother and sister and mother. That person. See, we have a heavenly Father. For the Son of Man is going to come with His angels in the glory of His Father. Not His own glory. Christ gives the glory to the Father. And then He will reward each according to what He has done. Have you accepted Christ? Then there's no reward for you if you haven't. If you've accepted Christ, then you get the reward of being adopted. And if you've done things in the name of Jesus by his Holy Spirit working in you, then you're storing up treasures in heaven that when you finally go to heaven and he says you're in because you know my son, he's going to show you all you stored up and go, thank you, good job. That's what the Bible says. We're not trying to get rewards. We're just trying to say, I got such a good dad. I just want to be sure he gets lots of presents because he's awesome. So I'm sending it to him. He goes on and says, going a little further. Oh, the king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed by my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. That God has had a plan that has not changed and it continues to go forward. Jesus says, going a little further, he fell face down and he prayed, my father, if it's possible, let this cup, that's the cup of judgment of the Passover, Pass from me. And Jesus says, yet not as I, my human will, would want, but as you will. See, Jesus is constantly pointing to the Father. Everything that we do in our life is constantly pointing to a Father. Many of you keep practicing the garbage your fathers put in your life. Stop it. Start practicing the glory and holiness of your heavenly Father. 
Figure out what that is and do that. That doesn't mean you can't honor and respect your earthly father. You can. But you always put that in the context of a heavenly father. Dive into the story in 1 Kings. It says, But Ahab, son of Omri, did what was evil in the Lord's sight more than all who were before him. Ahab doubled down on evil. He decided, I'm not listening to anybody, and I'm actually going to, and the stuff I am going to listen to, the evil stuff that my fathers did, I'm going to do even more of that evil. And then in verse, chapter 20, verse 1, after all this mess, God starts to send some problems Ahab's way. And it says, now Ben-Hadad, king of Aram. By the way, Hadad means noisy or clamorous. You're going to see this guy is kind of noisy. He just kind of babbles. He just says a bunch of stuff, but he can't deliver, right? That's what bad fathers do. They say a bunch of stuff, but they don't follow through. They, their yes is not yes. Their no is no. It's always yes. Oh, sorry. Our heavenly father, his yes is always yes, and his no is always no. And when you start changing that, be careful. Because you're messing with the holiness and the covenant and the righteousness of God. 32 kings, he assembled his entire army. 32 kings, along with horses and chariots, were with him. He marched up, besieged Samaria. That's the, that's the capital of the northern kingdom. He fought against it. He sent messengers into the city of Ahab of Israel and said to him, this is what the clamoring Hadad, by the way, Hadad also is, means they're like they're God. So this clamoring guy who claims he's a God says, your silver and your gold are mine and your best wives and children are mine. I don't know about you, if some dude knocked on my front door, said, everything, and we take your gold, and your, I'm going to take your wives and your daughters right now, there'd be a fight. There'd at least be a call to 911. Probably for him, not for me. Like, that's not happening. I've, I've been called to be a father. I live in a world that allows me to protect this. You're a foreign king. I'm a king. So it's not like you have authority over me, Ben-Hadad. You're not an authority figure. You're some other army. Some, like, I'm, I'm the king. No. But see, Ahab is already so compromised. It's so about him. It's so about keeping his kingdom and keeping his authority and keeping up all the appearances. Look at what Ahab does, because this is exactly what terrible fathers do. Then the king of Israel answered, just as you say, my lord, the king, I am yours along with all that I have. The messengers then returned and said, this is what Ben-Hadad says. I have sent messengers to, to you, messengers saying, you are to give me your gold or your silver, your gold, your wives and your children. Like Ahab just surrenders. Doesn't pray, doesn't ask God what he should do. Jesus surrendered on the cross, but that was kind of the plan. Like, he he kind of said that the whole time was going to happen. Like, Ahab just kind of says, oh, I don't, I can't really do anything. You're a king. You have an army. You have people. You can do something. Yeah, but I might die. Good. Die fighting. Not Ahab. He's just following the ways of the people before him, trying to keep the power, keep the appearances goes on and says, but as time, at this time tomorrow, Ben-Hadad said, I will send my servants to you and they will search your palace and your servants' houses and they will lay their hands on and take away whatever is precious to you. This guy says, first, this is what I want. When he sees weakness in Ahab, guess what he does? Oh, you're not even going to fight me? Then I'm coming for everything. This is exactly what our enemy Satan does every day time. You give him a little bit of a window, a little bit of surrender, and he's coming full in to take it all. He is going to take you to misery every time. And we fall for it because we think, well, I got to protect. I got to be nice. I got to, yeah, there's a time for all of that. This ain't the time. Goes on and says, then the king of Israel called for the elders of the land. Praise the Lord that he at least called for some advice. And then he says, think it over and you will see that this one is only looking for trouble. For he demanded my wives, my children, my silver, and my gold, and I didn't turn him down. And all the elders and the people said to him, don't listen or agree to this. So he said to Ben-Hadad's messenger, say to my lord the king, everything you demanded of your servant the first time, I will do. But this thing I cannot do. 
I am willing to sacrifice the lives of my children, sacrifice the lives of my wives. I mean, I'm not willing to like give up my kingship and like surrender myself. Oh, no, no, no. Everybody else is going to suffer. I'll even give up my gold if you just let me stay as my king, as a king. (laughs) And then he says, all the elders and the people said to him, don't do it. So say to my Lord, the king, everything you demand of your servant, I will do, but not this thing. So the messengers left and took the word back to him. Then Ben-Hadad sent messengers to him and said, may the gods punish me and do so severely if Samaria's dust amounts to a handful for each of the people who follow me. I'm coming after you. I'm going to make you dust, he says. The king of Israel answered, say this, don't let the one who puts on his armors boast like the one who takes it off. I love that Ahab has kind of a, a moment. He has a fatherly moment where he's like, Dude, it's easy to put armor on and act like you're big and bad and you're going to like destroy people like, you know, Goliath coming out marching, you know, and then little shepherd boy with a rock and a sling like bing and knocks you down. Like, don't brag about your armor until you've won the war. That's what he's saying. Like, Ahab kind of taunts him a little bit. When Ben-Hadad heard this response while he and the kings were drinking in the tents, They are so prideful, and they think they're just going to annihilate and take over everything, that they're just sitting back, drinking, having fun, having a good old time. They're scared of us. We don't need to worry about them. They're hammering back some cold ones. He says, so they took their possessions, and he said to his servants, take your positions. So they took their positions against the city. A prophet came to Ahab, king of Israel, and said, this is what the Lord says. Do you see this entire great army? I love that question. Do you see this great army? No, I was clueless. I was just, I had no idea there was a big army. Yes, I saw an army. Like, what kind of question? And isn't it awesome that God always asks us the really simple, dumb questions? So we can't get out of it, right? Like, he's just like, do you see an army? Yes. Good. Glad we got that covered. Then he says, I'm handing it over to you today. But I don't... They've already taken all the other towns around me. They've now sieged the city of Samaria. I I don't really have an army left. I just have some people here that have like taken shelter in the walls. Like that's a vast, there's 32 kings with all of their armies surrounding me, God. Like, ah. And God says, Ahab, you're wicked. You're awful. But let me just clarify to you why I'm doing this today. So that you may know that I, oh, sorry, thanks. So that you may know, he says, that I am Yahweh. So that you may know that I am Yahweh. I'll get it, don't worry. I'm clicker happy up here. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Okay, there we go. It's not about you, Ahab. Hey, dads, fathers, tune in for a second. It ain't about you. It's not about you. It's not about you. You are representing God Almighty in his eyes and you are representing to future generations the way of the heavenly father, period. When you go out into the world, you want to do his ways. We live in Babylon. How did God call his people to live in Babylon? Have you read that? Have you read Jeremiah? Or have you only read Jeremiah 29, 11 and you didn't read the rest of the chapter? Because 29, 11 says, this is the, the hope I have for you, declares the Lord, to prosper you, to give you a hope and a future, right? We love that verse to put on the bathroom wall while we're sitting there and read it and think, oh, it's wonderful, right? You didn't read the part before it where he says, and that's why I'm sending you into slavery the rest of your life until you die, and then I'll deliver the next generation at some point. Wait, I have to lead the, I got as a dad go in, dude, I got to do, oh no, oh no. I like the hope part, the peace, yeah. And the pathway through that is to surrender to Babylon and trust me and to go represent me there which is where we get the book of Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and these great men that show us how to live when we're not in the promised land. By the way, America's not the promised land. God did not make a covenant with America. I love my nation. I'm grateful we have people that fight, that are, that are men that step up, that fight for like godly values, godly ways. I am thankful. But God did not make a covenant with us. This is not my home. When Jesus comes back, he's not going to like destroy the world and go, oh, thank you, America. That's not what's going to happen. 
we're going to be wiped out too, and there's going to be one king in charge of it all. It's not like we get to vote. That's not going to happen. He goes on and says this. Ahab said, look at this, um, by whom? <laughs> like, hold on. I know you're going to deliver this army. I know you're going to, that's great. Praise the Yahweh. You're going to, this is awesome, but uh, just question. Who's going to, you send some angels? You're going to send like a fire from heaven like I ignored earlier when Elijah, like how's how's this going to happen? The prophet said, this is what the Lord says, by the young men of the provincial leaders. Then he asked, "Um, but who's to get those young men to like step up and fight and like go? You. (laughs) Dad, welcome to the call. You. You. It always comes back to the men. It always comes back to the fathers. Jesus said it came back to the father. All the kings said it comes back to the father. The New Testament said you're either of Adam, your father, or you're of the heavenly father. One of the two. Which one are you going to choose? This is a story of the Bible. And Ahab's like, you're going to start it. I'm going to start it. Like, I already surrendered once, twice. I surrendered twice already. Did you not see that? No, you go. You lead them. So Ahab counted the young men of the provincial leaders, and there were 232. (laughs) Wow, what a fighting force. 232 against hundreds of thousands. This is going to go well. After then, he counted all the Israelite troops. Well, that didn't go well. How much more do I have? 7,000. That's not enough. They marched out at noon while Ben-Hadad and the 32 kings who were helping him were getting drunk in their tents. I love this. God's timing is always perfect right? The young men of the provincial leaders marched out first, then Ben-Hadad sent out scouts, and they reported to him saying, men are marching out of Samaria. And there's like panic and chaos. What happens? Fast forward, then the king of Israel inflicted a great slaughter on Aram. The prophet approached the king said to him, hey, go strengthen yourself, then consider what you should do, for in the spring the king of Aram will march against you. Ahab wins this incredible battle. They slaughter the king, they they don't slaughter the king, they get rid of his armies, they push everybody back, and God's like, that was fun, wasn't it? You're you're not done yet. There's a lot more to fight. There's a lot more that's got to be done. He's coming back. The Bible tells us we have an enemy that's not done until we're done. There's a new battle coming and you better get ready for it. And that's what the prophet says. Don't take and gloat in this and be like, I am Ahab. I have won with my provincial. Oh, don't even go there. You get ready for the next battle. You go before the Lord. And he says, go and strengthen yourself. Consider what you should do for in the spring, the king of Aram will march again against you. Now the king of Aram's servants said to him, look at what they do. I love this. This is how the world, this is how bad fathers work with their children. They don't point them to the heavenly father. They don't point them to God where God says, I want everyone to know my name. No, look at what he does. Bad fathers always point to we need to adapt the circumstances so it works. It's pragmatic. Because the fathers of Aram tell the king this. Now the king of Aram's servants told him their gods are gods of the hill country because Jerusalem, Samaria was on a hill. This is why they were stronger than we were. Instead, we should fight them in the plain. Then we will certainly be stronger than they will because our gods are the gods of the plains, of the grass, and of the wheat. Like, that's what Baal and Asherah were. They got together, and because they slept together, then they produced crops that would feed them. So, you know, they sleep, they sleep. They lay horizontally in the plains, and then the grains come. That's our God. Their God's on a big hill. Their God's up on the hill. So, so that's where we made our mistake. It wasn't the fact that we have the wrong God, <laughs> We did the wrong thing. We just got to change our strategy. And then it says, and do this, remove each king from his position and appoint captains in their places. You know, it was the king's problems. You know, we just got a new battle plan. Raise another army for yourself like the army you lost, horse for horse, chariot for chariot, and let's fight them on the plain. And we will certainly be stronger than they will. The king listened to them and did so. You know what's going to happen. 
Here's what happens. In the spring, Ben-Hadad mobilized the Armenians and went up to attack Aphek to battle Israel. The Israelites mobilized, gathered supplies, and went to fight them. The Israelite camp in front of them, like two little flocks of goats. I love that. I love when the Bible puts a little details. Like, They're just like two little flocks of goats in this mass army of like craziness. And like, oh, look at those this flock of goats. It's so cute, right? It goes on. It says, while the Armenians filled the landscape, then the man of God approached and said to the king of Israel, I love that the guy that is being the prophet, the guy that is telling everyone what God says, the guy that is doing all the work, we don't even know his name. He gets no credit. He's just a man of God. How about you, dads? How much credit do you want? How about you just be the man of God? How about your kids grow up and say, my dad was a man of God. That's good, man. That's good enough. They don't need first name, last name. They just need man of God. That's all they need. This, we don't even know this guy, and he's like doing all, he's controlling the entire army. He's literally causing Israel to be saved and doing all this, and his name is man of God. I can't wait to meet him in heaven someday. Get to heaven and be like, that, yeah, that's me. That's God worked through me. Wasn't that awesome? Like, oh, you're the man of God. I had no idea. That's so awesome. Thank you. See, good fathers don't worry about getting credit because it's all credited to the Heavenly Father anyway because they're just a kid. They're just a son. You're just a daughter. It's not about your authority. This is what the Lord says. Because the Armenians have said Yahweh is a God of the mountains and not a God of the valleys, <laughs> I will hand over all this great army to you. Why? Why? So that then maybe you will know, Ahab, that I am the Lord. Because Ahab, you keep forgetting that I'm the Lord and you keep getting all the foreign gods. So, so maybe if I hand them completely over to you, you'll be like, oh, Yahweh really is God. I need to get rid of the golden calves and like go back to worshiping God. You know what's crazy? Most of us, we're just like Ahab. God does amazing things in our life. He teaches us amazing things. And we take credit and we turn our backs and we walk away. Because that's what's getting ready to happen. Watch this. The Israelites struck down the Armenians, verse 29, 100,000 foot soldiers in just one day. 100,000 dead in a day. Ben Hadad also fled and went into an inner room in the city. His servants said to him, Consider this. We've heard that the kings of the house of Israel are merciful kings. I can't believe, that is so beautiful. Watch this. So let's put on sackcloth around our waist and ropes around our heads and let's go out to the king of Israel. Perhaps he will spare your life. These guys recognize that Israel's God's different than theirs. They're like, okay, um, we are dead. Uh, Yahweh is, yeah, he's won. Our God's really failed us. But you know what? Our gods are not merciful. They just slaughter and murder. But that Israel God, that Yahweh... We've seen him let Ahab get by with stuff. We Maybe, just maybe, God will have some mercy on us. Now, notice, these men don't want to worship Yahweh. They just want to get out of their circumstances. Be very careful, dads. Be care very careful, mothers, fathers, daughters. Whatever. Be very careful that you aren't looking to get out of circumstances more than you are desiring to show how great Yahweh the Heavenly Father is. Because if Jesus would have desired to get out of circumstances, none of us would be saved. Not a one. He goes on, Then Ben-Hadad said to him, I restore to you the cities that my father took from your father. They go back to the fathers. They're going back to the fathers and doing business with the fathers. Your fa my father took some cities and now your father and the fathers, Right? And you may set up marketplaces for yourself in Damascus. Oh, that's so nice of you, defeated king with no army. Oh, I'm giving you back the cities. I can take them. Your army's dead. Like Ahab is like falling for this, and we do this too. We fall for the nice, the peace. We fall for the easy. Oh, he's giving me back the cities. They're already yours. He can't fight you. You killed his army. Oh, yeah. Forgot about that. And then he acts like, oh, and I'm even going to let you set up marketplaces. Oh, you're going to let me, Mr. Ben-Hadad, noisy claimer, foreign guy. 
I just beat you. You're in sackcloth and ashes. Like, no. And God has told his people not to make treaties with foreign nations. He said, you are not to make treaties with them. Do not do it. He says, Ahab responded, on the basis of this treaty, I release you. So he made a treaty with them and released him. Guys, we do this all the time. We want to be liked. We think, well, now I can use Ben Haddad because, like, he'll be my servant king. Like, I'll let him keep some power, but he knows that my God is bigger than his. So, like, I'm going to, I'm going to use this situation for, for God. But use this situation for God. No, Ahab, you're using this situation for you. And you won't do what God's asked you to do. And here's what happens. One of the sons of the prophets, again, we have no idea what this guy's name is. I love this. He's just a son. He's just a son who obeys his father. He's a prophet because he obeyed his father who was a prophet. By the way, if you're a Christian, God calls you a prophet, priest, and a king according to who? The heavenly father who has made you a son or a daughter in Christ. He said to his fellow prophet, by the word of the Lord, strike me. (laughs) But the man refused to strike him, right? Right? He told him, because you did not listen to the voice of the Lord, mark my words, when you leave, a lion will kill you. Ahab refused to strike the king, Ben-Hadad, when God told him, get rid of him. Don't play around with this. Don't play around with this sin. By the way, the reason Ahab allowed Ben-Hadad, you ready for this? The reason he allowed him is because Ben-Hadad's gods were also Ahab's gods because Ben-Hadad worshipped Baal and Asherah and so Ahab thought well if Yahweh isn't necessarily fully God but there's these other gods out there then they would be pleased with me if I let Ben-Hadad stay around you see the mental game that goes on that we play that Ahab plays This prophet is going up to him and saying, strike me in the face. If a prophet comes to you and says, strike him in the face, please do so. If I ever come to you and be like, please, right now, strike me in the face, do it, right? Just do it, just, you know? Why? Because the prophet is getting ready to prove a point to Ahab. And he needs to be struck in the face to say, Ahab, you ready for this? I'm willing to take what you are always unwilling to take. Jesus took everything that we try not to take. Jesus took everything, the shame, the curse, the beating, the blood, and we're like, oh yeah, he took it all, now I don't have to. No, if you follow him, you're gonna follow him in taking those beatings. Follow him in the suffering because you say, I wanna be like him. And so this prophet's like, You won't strike me. Oh, no, I couldn't do that. I'm such a righteous prophet. I'm such a nice prophet. I couldn't hit a fly. I couldn't hurt anybody. Well, then you're going to die by a lion. If if you're unwilling to sometimes have to resort to violence, then violence is going to come on you. We don't have a country if people weren't being willing to be violent. We would all be Nazis if the world said, we're going to be violent against this guy, Hitler. It's going to take violence. Nothing else is going to change it. This prophet is trying to prove that point, and this other prophet's thinking, but I don't want to judge anybody, and I'm so nice. I don't want to hit you. The prophet's like, well, then you're going to be eating my line. When he left him alone, when he left him, a lion attacked him and killed him. Now, if the guy was a prophet, guess what? He got attacked and killed by a lion, and then he went and met Who? The lion of the tribe of Judah. I think that's ironic. You get killed by a lion and then you go to heaven because you're a prophet, which means you follow Yahweh. You just made a mistake. But this mistake was really costly. It's like, you know, you're driving along and you make a mistake on the road and boom, you're gone. You wake up and oh goodness, that was it. Because I just made a small mistake. Didn't check my blind spot. Semi, boom, done, over. I just made a mistake. I should have punched him in the face. I didn't. And then he wakes up and he's like, oh, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Amazing. The prophet found another man and said to him, strike me. So the man struck him, inflicting a wound. Then the prophet went and waited for the king on the road. He disguised himself with a bandage over his eyes. As the king was passing by, he cried out to the king and said, your servant marched out into the middle of the battle. Suddenly a man, look at this, 
turned aside and brought someone to me and said, guard this man. If he's ever missing, it will be your life in place of his life, or you will weigh out 75 pounds of silver. That's enough of a lifetime of wages. So it's like, you either give your life or you give me your whole lifetime of wages, your choice. Because you didn't do what the king asked you to do. He gave you a responsibility, you failed. The only way you pay for a responsibility that you failed in, given by a king, is with your life. That's why Jesus had to die. Somebody had to pay the price. And we couldn't pay it. But while your servant was busy here and there, so this guy who's just the prophet, he's like, I was kind of busy. I was supposed to watch this guy and keep an eye, but you know, I got busy. I got distracted. There's stuff to do. I mean, we live in Bloomington. There were trails and bikes. It's, I was having a good old time. I had no idea. Like it just, the king of Israel said to him, that will be your sentence. You yourself have decided. And he quickly removed the bandage from his eyes. The king of Israel recognized that he was the one, one of the prophets. The prophet said to him, this is what the Lord says, because you've released from your hand the man I had set apart for destruction, it will be your life in place of his life and your people in place of his people. Then the king of Israel left for home, resentful and angry as he entered Samaria. If we're honest, most of us are resentful and angry that God just told us the truth instead of thankful that he loved us enough to show us the truth, to be a good father. We just, we hate it. We can't stand it. This prophet's like, Ahab could have repented here. He wouldn't. His resentment and his anger causes him, we'll skip through this, but causes him to go down a road he should have never gone down because Proverbs says this, do not despise the Lord's instruction, my son. Do not loathe his discipline. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves just as a father, the son he delights in. Hebrews says, and you've forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons. My son, do not take the Lord's discipline lightly or faint when you're reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and punishes every son he receives. Endure hardship as a discipline. It makes you better. God is dealing with you as sons. For what son is there that a father does not discipline? Well, bad ones, wicked ones. So here's what happens. After some time, the Bible says Ahab gets really, ready for this? He gets really more and more bitter and resentful and he's hanging out at his home and there's this guy named Naboth and Naboth has a vineyard and it was his father's vineyard and Ahab sees it and says, I want it. He offers Naboth, can I buy the vineyard? Naboth says, no. You want to know why you can't buy it? Because this was given by my heavenly father to my father in the inheritance when we came into the promised land with Joshua. So I can't give this to you because it's not yours, even though you're king. It's my heavenly father who gave it to my father and I'm entrusted with it. Ahab gets depressed because he can't get what he wants. Sound familiar? When you're resentful and bitter, all you see is what you don't have and what you want. It's exactly what happens. So then Jezebel, his wife, a lovely woman, sees her husband's misery and says, oh, husband, I love you. I want to help you. And Jezebel hatches a plan. She goes, you know, Naboth is a righteous man. So if I call a fast, Naboth will come to it because he wants to fast and pray for his nation. So we'll call a fast. Naboth will show up. I'll send two false witnesses. They'll accuse him of cursing God and then we'll stone him to death. And that's exactly what happens. And he is stoned to death. They stone a righteous man just to take his vineyard after God has delivered them from everything. It's not enough. I gotta have more. God's holding out on me. That's our heart so often. They hatch this plan. Naboth is dead. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah. He goes and he meets Ahab and he looks at him and he says, so get, let me get this straight. You murdered Naboth and that wasn't enough for you. That didn't get your attention to repent. Then you stole everything he had. I, 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 you gave away everything you had to Ben Haddad, you were going to, and I gave it all back to you. When are you going to learn? Ahab? And then the Lord says, the place where the dogs licked Naboth's blood, the dogs will lick yours. Ahab said to Elijah, you've caught me, my enemy. 
Elijah's like, I've caught you because you devoted yourself to what is evil in the Lord's sight. I caught you because you're a moron. I love that. Like, I caught you because you're an idiot, not because I'm, I'm really wise, like I'm really smart. You're, you're dumb. You do dumb stuff, right? He's like, this isn't rocket science. And then he tells him that Jezebel's blood will be licked up as well. Finally, finally because of that, verse 27, 21, 27. When Ahab heard these words, he tore his clothes, he put on sackcloth over his body, and he fasted. He lay down in sackcloth and walked around subdued. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite. Have you seen how Ahab has humbled himself before me? I will not bring the disaster during his lifetime. I will have mercy. We sang about mercy earlier. Because he has humbled himself before me, I will bring disaster on his house during his son's lifetime. Now we think that's a promise, like, oh, God's going to kill his son. It's a warning. And I don't know about you, but if I may have a son and I read that, I'm like, how about we just punt that to the next son? And I'll just follow Yahweh, I'll be righteous. And the next son, you know, and then I'll tell my son, hey son, there's a curse on us, it's coming someday. You don't want to be that son. That could have gone on for like generations. Nobody being cursed, nobody hurt. Unfortunately, this is exactly what happens, you find out later. As we wrap up, for those of you who want to know what the ways of the Father is, look at this. Paul writes a letter to a church in Corinth. And then he responds back and he says, For even if I grieved you with my letter like Elijah grieved Ahab, I do not regret it, even though I did regret it since I saw that the letter grieved you, yet only for a little while. Now I rejoice. Look at this. Not because you were grieved, but because your grief led to repentance. Look at this. This is critical. For you were grieved as God willed so that you did not experience any loss from us. For, good, for godly grief produces a repentance not to be regretted, and leading to salvation. But worldly grief produces death. If you're just all sad all the time, then you're going to get depressed. You're going to kill yourself. You're going to hurt others. It's going to go badly. But if you get to a place where you're at your, your bottom and you cry out to God, there is a God, even if you're as wicked as Ahab, who will show up. For consider how much diligence this very thing, the grieving as God wills, has produced in you. What a desire to clear yourselves. What indignation, what fear, what deep longing, what zeal, what justice in every way you showed yourselves to be pure in this matter. Paul's like, you actually responded when you were confronted. Wow, that is amazing. Not defensive, Dad, not, who are you to judge me? I'm father of this house. You don't tell me. You don't tell I got a heavenly father. Maybe he's trying to speak through you, so I'll, I'll tune in at least for a minute. I, I don't think that's the case, but let me pray about it. Let me think about it. Goes on, Jesus says this, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own mother, father and mother and wife and children, brothers and sisters, yet he is in his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Ahab decided to bear his own cross. He finally came to a place where he said, I'm done, I'm over and every one of us have to come to that place. We can't live on what mom and dad did or what mom and dad didn't or the blessings of mom and dad. God looks at us in his sight one-on-one -on -one and asks us, will you follow me? Will you be my disciple? And if you will, you got to lay down your life. You surrender it all. Don't be like Ben Haddad and think I can play games with God. I can come in like sackcloth and ashes and pretend and get some mercy. Don't do it. Surrender. Psalm 27, I was reading this this morning in my devotional. It says, even if my father and mother abandon me, David writes, the Lord cares for me. I am certain that I will see the Lord's goodness in the land of the living. And then he ends the psalm with, just wait for the Lord. Be strong and courageous. Wait for the Lord. It's a beautiful, beautiful message. And then Jesus says to us as we finish, my father is glorified by this, that you produce much fruit and prove to be my disciples. That's the fruit of repentance. Just saying, I'm not going to go that way, I'm going to go God's way. That's what repentance means. Repentance means turning from one way and going God's way. And then he says, look at this. As the father has loved me, I also loved you. Remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love just as I've kept my Father's commands. It's like simple. And remain in His love. It's not hard. 
Just remain in his commands. When you figure, when you figure out you didn't remain in his commands and you failed, you know what you do? Sorry, didn't remain in your commands. Hey, Dad, really, I apologize. Please forgive me. Okay. It's, it's not hard. This is simple. And then he goes on and he says, look, I have spoken these things so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. There's a lot of misery in our world because of dads, because of fathers, because of the mess we've made. But there's a heavenly father who has a joy that he wants to give. He wants us to turn and restore. He wants us to know his ways. Do you even care about the ways of your father? Do you embrace the ways of the world and the ways you want instead of the ways that God says we should live? Do you even know what repentance is and the Holy Spirit coming into your life to convict you and to help you understand the truth of the word? Do you know the love of Jesus in the midst of your sin and mess, that there's a Father who still loves you? Do you tell and teach others about how great a dad and a family you have? Or are you just resentful and angry at God and the church all the time? Give your life. You only have one of them to give, and you're going to give it to something, either a heavenly father or an earthly father. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your word this morning. Lord, there's a lot here, but Lord, that's why 1 Kings, 2 Kings, and 2 Chronicles covers over 450 years. Lord, it shows us what it looks like for us to see you as our heavenly father and to see us as your children adopted through a relationship with Jesus Christ who paid the price we deserve. That we are covered by his sacrifice and blood. We don't work our way to salvation. We can't earn a relationship with you. All we can do is surrender and hear you say, I love you. You are forgiven. And so this morning, Lord, if anyone here doesn't know you, I pray they wouldn't get more resentful and hard-hearted and bitter. But Lord, I pray that they would come before you and they would surrender finally, like Ahab did. That they would repent. Lord, that, that they would see that you have mercy for them and love. And Lord, for those of us who are believers, I pray that we would take this to heart because Ahab and all the people of Israel claimed to be believers, but they didn't live it out. They had all these other idols and all these other things. Lord, I pray that you would speak to our hearts Lord, would we get serious about wrestling with who you really are as a father and why it's so important, the order you've created. And Lord, help us not to throw that off too easily like Ahab, but to embrace it and to give our lives to it all the way to the cross if necessary. Lord, I thank you that you can do it. And I thank you that we can come to you however we are, come before you because you are a good, good father. We pray in it.